Hello and welcome to Teaching My Cat to Read, the very serious book review podcast. I'm Eli. I'm Em. And I'm Lottie. And this week we're discussing everything about The Tenant of Wildfell Hall by Anne Bronte. Yeah, we're going to start this episode with a little like forward, um, basically sort of flagging that this book discusses a number of quite heavy topics, including uh, domestic abuse. And yeah, so if you don't want to listen to this episode, if, if check the words in, in the description box below. We've put all the like different triggers that we'll, we will discuss in this episode there. And we also would recommend if you haven't read this book before and you would like to listen uh, to just go and check out the Wikipedia page for like a plot summary just to make sure you're comfortable with all the topics in the book before listening to this episode. And we really don't mind if you decide to skip it. <laughs> take care of yourself out there, Please folks. take care of yourself. Yeah, that that would m- mean more to us than listening to the episode. <laughs> yeah, I finished this book and I sort of went, I don't really know how I feel now. Like, yeah. it's, it's, it is pretty heavy, even though I'm not really usually susceptible to sort of I, I, I don't normally get that way about books I can normally read whatever and just be kind of fine mm. yeah so the sort of the thesis statement of this book I guess is that m- marriage as it existed in the 1840s or you know mid 1800s kind of kind of sucked and that women had no agency uh, <laughs> news just in folks you heard it here first <laughs> yeah it's it's I, I definitely read it as uh, an exploration of women's agency or lack thereof within mm. the institution of marriage and what that mm-hmm. does not only to women, but to men. Yeah. And, you know, it it very it, it centres around this woman who, I won't say rushes into a marriage, but um, it marries a man who is just a scoundrel. He is abusive to her and she ends up leaving him because her she doesn't want to raise their son around him because she can see mm. that her son will turn out to be like him and she can't yeah. abide that. Yeah. And it's it's written in a series of letters from this character called Gilbert. So the first sort of, it's in three parts. And mm-hmm. the first part is letters of Gilbert to his friend. Um, Gilbert is also not safe from being unproblematic. He is also a bit of a dick. Uh, he's trash. <laughs> he's trash. Like all the other men in this novel, he's trash. <laughs> yeah, basically. And he meets this mysterious young widow, Helen Graham, who moves into the hall in the... I guess the town or the area that that mm. they that they live in, um, and this hall has been empty for a long, long time. So it's all a bit a bit bit of gossip in the town of who this woman is, mm. and she then uh, befriends Gilbert. And well, no, he befriends her, and he is quite he's quite pushy about it. Actually, she doesn't really want anything to do with him. Does it count as befriending if the other person is deeply unwilling the whole time? Yeah, doesn't it's, count. <laughs> it's slightly problematic. So he's sort of like he he decides to befriend her, and she ends up giving him this diary of her diary to try and make him get his friggin' thick head through it that other people have different friggin' world experiences. Yeah. Well, what happens is <laughs> he falls in love with her, yeah, and she uh, she clearly has feelings for him, but there's something going on in her past that means that she can't. It's not easy, right? And yeah. he completely misinterprets the scene between her and another man uh, and becomes incredibly jealous. And there's this mm-hmm. incredible miscommunication, you know, classic rom-com trope. And to clear things up, yeah, she gives him the diary, which forms the second third of the book, which is the story of her abusive marriage. Mm-hmm. And it's just this, it, something that um, Em said to me before reading this book, before I read this book, and that I was so stark upon reading it, is that this this diary is full of accounts of, men who've been awful to her right or around her about her yeah mm. and they're they're really just appalling pushy or abusive behavior and gilbert actually displays so many of those same qualities in the first third yeah. of the book and he yeah. i don't think he ever really comes to terms with that in the final third which is what happens there was, back in the present there is a after. single throwaway line where he acknowledges that he has behaved like hargrave who is not like other men, hashtag nice guy, um, who basically tries to seduce her away from her abusive mm. husband, despite the fact that she's told him repeatedly that she's not interested. And Gilbert, Gilbert, does that remind you of anyone? 
Gilbert. Yeah. I mean, to be fair, and I mean, this is going to be the first instance of us sort of explicitly talking about this stuff. To be fair, um, mm. Hargrave does almost rape her. Um, yeah. And Gilbert never does that, but he is, he refuses her soft no so many times. And it's just so uncomfortable to read. Mm. I mean, which is the point, right? That's what Ambronto was getting at. Yeah, mm. like, I don't know if you guys had, because uh, M told me to read the, like, forward. Yeah, the author's mm-hmm. note to the second edition, yeah. Oh my god. Like, it, so it's written it from quite Acton Bell, which was her pseudonym when she wrote this book in what, 1848. And another point is, is like, unlike Austin, where it's romantic, you know, Pride and Prejudice, everyone that ends up happily married, whoopie do. In my mm. head, the equivalent of this is going, in, in Pride and Prejudice, Lydia marries Wickham. Lydia is 16 year old. He's what, say, let's say late 20s, mid 30s. He has a gambling problem and many debts. And at the end of Pride and Prejudice, it's all sort of like, oh, it's fine because Darcy paid off all of his debts and it's all fine now. Whereas this goes, that is problematic and it's... <coughs> and yeah. And the foreword that she wrote is says two things. It's basically saying, "Oh, stop guessing uh, like my my gender," because I guess some people at the time were saying, "Who wrote this, a man or a woman?" And then secondly, like I don't know if you guys have got the quote. Like she 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 talks about how I have the book right here somewhere. Yes, it, she she wants to sort of protect young women and girls going into the same situation, yeah. and wants them to recognize that it's not healthy yeah. and i'm just thinking god how many times has she seen this she says this case is an extreme one as i trusted none will fail to perceive but i know that such characters do exist if i have warned one rash youth from following in their steps or prevented one thoughtless girl from falling into the very natural error of my heroine the book has not been written in vain um yeah and it was it was based on a case that her her father so the bronte's father i think mm. was a reverend yes yeah. he was and there was a woman in their parish who was in the situation where her husband was incredibly abusive and their the, the bronte's father advised her because uh, he was quite liberal for his time to leave him and take the children and when anne was about well i think around the time of this book being written that woman came back having taken their father's advice and and left mm. the husband and she was much her life was changed entirely for the better because of it mm. yeah and so it uh, i think some people hypothesized that some of the people in this book were maybe based on their brother branwell who i don't know anything about but apparently I, i'm given to understand he was not great i mean the main thing to know about him is that he had a very serious addiction problem that eventually killed him like that is the oh, yeah mm, the sort of the be- very bare bones a- and that was like why well, one of the sort of theories on my readings around the internet. So, mm. yeah, you know, take it with a, I say yeah. a pinch of salt, probably like a two kilogram bag of salt. Mm-hmm. <laughs> is that like there was this whole, this book discusses the whole arc of like this uh, like Christian redemption of like, oh, you're going to redeem mm. yourself by redeeming your husband and like lift him in out of this mm. position of like lift him out of his alcoholism and his gambling debts. And his bad mm. friends. And like you'll mm. prepare him for heaven. And what happened when Branwell died is Anne didn't go and look after her brother, but Charlotte and Emily did. And I, there was like one thing saying that Charlotte, the reason that this was basically pushed down and not publicized after Anne's death was that Anne didn't go and look after the brother when he was very sick from his from his addictions because mm. like, I, mm. I think Anne could see it coming. And like, I don't know, it just... It's just when you read into the history of like their family and the fact that, say, I was down a Wikipedia hole that, say, both Emily and Charlotte's writings of Byronic heroes, mm. of where it's like a redemption of... Is it Heathcliff yeah. and Wuthering Heights? Where it's like, oh, we're going to save him and then it's all fine at the end because we saved him. We've elevated him out of this, like... I think he's dead at the end, actually. <laughs> Is he dead? Well, that's elevated him out of his... Uh, because he's not around anymore (laughs) yeah redemption equals death (laughs) it's interesting to talk about i guess brownwell in the context of wildfell hall because there is a character who very much struggles with addiction in it Mm. and who is not lifted up out of it by a woman he does it himself um and it's lord lobra who's one of the i think the two decent men in this book all the rest Mm -hmm. but (laughs) lord lobra is he's one of so the, the the abusive husband is mr huntingdon and mm-hmm. he is kind of, he's got this cadre of, of scoundrel friends. And among them is Lord Lobra, who used to have a very serious gambling problem. 
and he sort of traded that up for an addiction to alcohol which is yeah. actually a really common um phenomenon in people with uh, who struggle with addiction is that you 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 can sort of it's why people who quit smoking often end up with um like chewing a lot of gum or something because there's a mm. Uh, yeah you, you sort of can substitute you have to replace obsession with obsession yeah. it's one of those exactly, fun yeah. little like throwaway jokes in Pratchett the whole like vampires replacing mm-hmm. their obsession for blood with like coffee or photography <laughs> or something and like if you take the coffee away they absolutely lose it uh, which is something I like you know it's a fun joke in Pratchett and then you realise that that's actually yeah in real life that is how addiction yeah. works it's if you can replace it with something harmless I think that's mm-hmm. that's probably a case of Anne having very close personal experience with it and that coming mm. through in her writing uh mm, anyway yeah. and this lord lowbury he basically does reform himself he stops drinking he stops gambling and eventually cuts ties with those friends because they keep trying to tempt him back into his old habits like crabs in a bucket who can't bear to see one of their number try to crawl out mm. yeah and he is not redeemed by a woman he does it himself and actually his wife who doesn't love him and only married for him for the money is a negative ex- influence on his attempts to better himself mm and he's he, he and there's there's one other guy in this book who I think are like decent men at all, mm. and it's just yeah interesting to view that then through the lens of Anne having a, a, a close family member who mm. really ha- also struggled with addiction. I've got mm. to say the just talking about the complicated family dynamics with the Brontes. I think the best source I've seen on this, if you want something that you don't need to take with quite such a big pinch of or bag of salt. Samantha Ellis's Take Courage is a biography of Anne Bronte that covers, like, there is a chapter dedicated to each of, like, the relationship she had with each member of her family. Oh, okay. As well as, like, you know, different aspects of the books and um, the sort of, the publication history and Mm -hmm. how fraught that was. Yeah. And, like, that's, I haven't, I I meant to reread it for this and then I didn't because I just did not have the spoons. But, like, Mm -hmm. if you want the, like... I think mm. it's a it's a very good sort of nuanced take on, like yeah, compl- the complicated family dynamics at play here. Well, thinking of going to tend to somebody who who is dying because of their struggles with uh, addiction or substance abuse, mm. Helen, the main character, goes back to her abusive husband. Yeah. After she has she has made successfully made her escape with her son and has mm. um, taken up tenancy in Wildfire Hall. Um, because he is dying or because he is very very ill and he does then die of it but pretty unambiguously because of his substance abuse yeah Yeah. and it's this it's this really interesting thing where you know obviously it's if if she doesn't go back because she's still in his thrall you know Mm. she goes Mm. back because she believes in her duty to him in, 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 in a way that isn't to do with him it's to do with what she thinks marriage is yeah, I think. yeah. And it's something that was very interesting to me because I read this th- the first time I read this I was a lot younger I was like 14, 15 I think and it really annoyed me that she went mm-hmm. back and the the sort of to be fair I was in I was also in my like asshole atheist phase as well so the, the <laughs> Christianity was um, much more annoying to me than it is now <laughs> um, <laughs> but um one of the things that struck me on a reread, and I think it's largely because I've just finished, um, or I'm most of the way through Sarah Shulman's Conflict is Not Abuse, which talks about duty of care a lot. Mm. And one of the things that really struck me was that, okay, she didn't have to. I don't think Anne Bronte tries to give you the impression that, like, this is the only valid path for her to take, right? Yeah. It would have been perfectly legitimate for her to just let him die. Like, she was, she didn't owe him anything. It wasn't... Yeah, it was in a way she owed it to herself. Yeah, you know, it's what she understood of her duty as a Christian person, right? Mm. It, it follows her entire p- plot theme, though, of like, when you read the diary, it's her sort of crush, in fact, her teenage crush, because she's 18, or like 17, mm. 18, and the aunt is giving really solid advice mm-hmm. of don't marry too soon, like, you shouldn't marry this person because of X, Y, Z, like you need to marry someone who's good and who's like effectively safe. Like she, she she's, wants- she's basically saying love is all well and good, but make sure they're a good partner too. Yeah, and mm. and I think that's a completely valid point. But like mm. Helen is, she's a teenager and she's going to have mm. teenage crushes. But the problem is at the time your teenage crush, you get married to them, and it was just so sad reading it because she's always arguing this point about how she's read her bible and she's going to redeem him and that's her her purpose mm. in life is to redeem him and helen's aunt is saying well 
is it though like is that your purpose in life like don't you think you're worth a bit more than that yeah and and helen like it's clearly something that was either taught to women at the time Mm. or something that anne bronte thought would resonate with people at the time this idea of this redemption it's Mm -hmm. very like i tell you i can't place it but it does feel very familiar and it feels very victorian it feels very gothic that kind of um, I don't, to be honest, I think you see it in modern romances with like more bodice rippery type things where the guy mm-hmm. is, you know, he's, uh, he's whatever the f- <laughs> asshole's name is in Fifty Shades of Grey, you know, where he's like Christian Grey, you know, he's rich and he's got all these terrible habits and you're the only one he like that can sort of tame the Save beast him. or whatever. I mean, we see it in children's literature or children's mm. oh, God, media, yeah. Beauty, Beauty and the Beast. Yeah. I mean, that's very literally, she mm. stopped, she turns him back from a beast into a man. Yeah. What, whatever the other, re- like, you know, however else you read it, that is the actual literal point of the story. Mm. Um, and there's this point early in the book where Gilbert Markham's mother is saying, is, is describing what she thinks marriage is. Mm. And she is saying that it is the duty of the wife to basically tend to her husband's every need and do what he wants. And it's the husband's duty to accept it. And that the wife should, she should always put her husband's happiness and needs first. Mm. Yeah. And Gilbert, in one of the rare moments where he, I actually like him in this book, yeah. Yeah. says, basically says to his mother and sort of, uh, and, and says in greater detail in the body of this letter that he's writing to, I think his brother-in-law, we, we never actually meet, he's just, yeah. you know, the, the person who these letters are addressed to. He's saying that actually, um, he's saying, I, I should take as much pleasure in making my wife happy. I should, I should like better to give than to receive. Mm. And for what it's worth he is one of the less objectionable men in these in this book in that he does actually seem to give a damn what helen wants it and feels it's just that he doesn't also then necessarily respect it or yeah. follow it to its logical conclusion or think critically <laughs> i was gonna like just sort of follow on from that with the whole like gilbert's upbringing there's a couple of notes i've mentioned where like for example one where he says um for my mother who maintained there was no one good enough for me and then, like, there's another couple of references where... Oh, yeah. The spoiling of sons in this book is huge. He's the golden mm. child. He can do absolutely no wrong. And then, like... I, and he's sort of be just riding on this, like, you know, I can do no wrong. And that's what he's been brought up to be. So I kind of give him, like, a... T- like A little bit more credit for having rejected some of that. Yeah. But at the same time, that doesn't excuse him from being a dick. Like... Oh, that, you know you can't you can't just turn around and be like oh well i'm a dick because my parents told me i was a golden child it's like no go to therapy and sort your life out like <laughs> i mean yeah you don't have the right to be stupid you know it's was freud around yet like i'm not sure therapy existed yet but <laughs> well yeah. just gonna talk to your friend then because that was one of the i think i'm i swear to god there was a reference where it's like you need to talk about how you feel there was something that i was like mm. oh my god there's so many like this book is so forward thinking Mm -hmm. it's very it's very modern i think that was the thing that really struck me like just the first so the very first conversation we see helen graham have with her new neighbors including gilbert and his his mother yes like she just dives straight in on the firstly like the the microaggressions like on every side people are telling Mm. her that she doesn't know how to raise her son that she's not intelligent enough like, she thinks she's good enough to be everything to the kid, but she's not, blah, blah, blah. Your son is going to turn out gay if you're nice to him. All of this shit. And yeah. she immediately goes into, like, okay, you are misrepresenting what I have said I am going to do. The world is hard, and that means we ought not to be, right? I'm going yeah. to look after my kid as long as I can. I'm not going to let him struggle unnecessarily, because, like, God knows there's enough pain in this world without that. That's mm-hmm. not the same as saying I'm going to spoil him and coddle him and make sure he can't handle anything on his own. I'm walking a very, like, carefully thought out middle way here. And on every side, people are going, oh, so you think your kid would be better off a Nancy then? Oh, so you think your kid... And you're just... Yeah. Like, she just goes so hard. It's really impressive. The spoiling of sons is a huge theme mm. throughout this book. And there, and it, it is sort of mentioned a lot throughout the book mm. that um, Helen thinks that this is a huge factor in why her husband turned out the way that he did. Mm. Yeah. And she is trying to be that difference between her son and her husband. Yeah. And there, I mean, it said it said multiple times as well. Like, I think my, my husband would be a better person if he had more to do. 
and the mm. the th- like whatever you think of Gilbert as a character, like he is a gentleman farmer. He does work. He is connected to. He, he is he is not in an ivory tower of like just mm. uh, living the gentleman's life. He is actually yeah. he does actually work in the fields. So there is sort of that that's kind of borne out in the 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 person that Helen does end up falling in love with, and we assume ends up happily married for the rest of their lives too. Mm. Mm. Is somebody who actually does things with his time. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, one of the parenting choices that people are like ragging on her for is that she has decided to try and condition her son against liking the taste of alcohol. So she mm. she mixed in some very small amounts of emetics with it whenever she gave it to him so that he would not throw up, but feel, feel bad. And yeah. that whenever he's sick, she gives him some and she now uses it as a like, you'd better be good or I'll give you some brandy with water. And yeah. What you don't have the context for when you first read that conversation, but you do when you read her diary, is that by this point, her husband has already begun giving the son lots of alcohol and teaching him to swear and teaching him to be disrespectful and cruel to his mother and turning him mm. into a mini version of himself. And so yeah. it's not it's not in a in a vacuum that Helen has made this decision. It's a very yeah. conscious deconditioning of... Uh, so she's not trying to deprogram her son from mm. she sees the path laid out before him for him to become his father and his father yeah. is so awful but the thing is she should not be obliged to bear all of that to these people she's barely she barely knows yeah to justify her parenting decisions particularly when they're the sort of people that I mean, it, it's interesting like you kind of you read it's very odd to read it from a modern perspective right because you can't tell like you feel like it must be quite radical, but like a lot of the things that Helen is saying, a lot of the things that people are acting like they're normal, like giving kids alcohol, like not getting yeah. them drunk, but just giving kids booze is mm. just like seen as this completely normal thing to the point where even the vicar is like, you know, it's, mm. a, it's a moral good to go yeah. on the lash. And you're like, I'm sorry, it's what now? He says something like it's, it's, a, it's a blessing and a mercy, like alcohol is a blessing mm. and a mercy. And like, it, it's, yeah, I mean... I, I again thinking about Anne's the context of Anne's brother like I wonder yeah. what her opinions were about the way that he was parented and what her experience with you know people yeah people's attitudes to alcohol with regards to him were I, I was reading that but because there was there was a large um I remember you telling me what the name of the book was but it was about how there was a large level of alcoholism because doctors were prescribing alcohol. And then mm. this woman wrote a book about how she became an alcoholic because the doctor prescribed her alcohol and mm. how alcoholism isn't great and mm. it's bad and you shouldn't do it as a concept. <laughs> and, it, it, and and you need help if you, if, if you are in this situation, basically. That's what this, this mm. book was about. And there was a couple of other, like, I guess... Uh, mm. articles i was reading of how Anne bronte was i mean this is such a feminist book it cannot mm. be understated yeah. but it, it's not only that it's just what was kind of i think the most difficult thing for me for reading this book is mm. you're going this, this still happens doesn't it like it's not oh yeah, yeah. i i know these men this is not this is not something from 150 years ago, like Pride and Prejudice, where it's like, oh, Regency, oh, a ball, oh, that doesn't happen now. Oh, isn't this fun with some dresses and some costumes and all that yeah. jazz? You're reading yeah. this and you're just going, this still happens. Yeah. This is still a thing. I was saying this to Em last night, we were talking about it, and I was like, it's yeah. so pre- it's such a precise portrait. Like, I yeah. know these men. I, I have known these men in my life. Yeah. And, and that's what's so sad is like in mm. 150 years we haven't got better at not producing these men it's, it's mm. still it's still not changed and you're still going against maybe it's not in this setting for example like you say with the whole mm. um bringing up her son in in such a way but it is in the sense of it's still there when you're like oh boys will be boys boys have these toys girls have these mm. toys and it's like that's it's like why the how the fuck can you gender toys do you know what i just had the most depressing thought as well these mm. men run our government now yeah. yeah you can trace the through line of entitlement and um uselessness all the way yeah. from and i think the thing that sort of really hits home is when you act, like I, I made a note of like kind of all the little things in her diary but uh, because i knew she was it was her husband was abusive i was like okay let's just like try and mark up like things that happened 
before she gets engaged i would love to know how long that document is you know it's so fucking <laughs> long like there's a, I, I made a note where he's like gaslighting her because he's like mm. he's basically saying you don't hate me you hate annabelle wilmot like she's jealous because her husband i guess she married yeah she's married to lord lobra she's the one who marries him for his money yeah and i don't think she got married at that point it was like helen has married huntington but uh, Annabella Wilmot hadn't married her husband at that point. And it's like, he seized my hand and held it against my will. It's like, mm, that's not great. And then it's like, I made a desperate effort to free my hand from his grasp. Why are you in such a hurry to leave me, Helen? He said with a smile of the most provoking self-sufficiency. You don't hate me, you know. It is Annabella Wilmot you hate, not me. And I'm like, that is just gaslighting 101. Mm. And then you know, there's, a, there's a really great quote I keep seeing on Tumblr about how when somebody tells you what you are feeling, that's abuse. Like, yeah, it is. Mm. It is. And he does it constantly. Just cut every word out of his mouth. And it's it's really, really awful. I mean, it's worth noting that like it's not only the men who are awful in this. It's kind of everyone, kind of everyone. There's like Lord Lobra, um, Frederick mm-hmm. Lawrence, who is Helen's sort of estranged brother. Like um, mm-hmm. it's sort of like their shared father didn't really give it's like half brother i think yeah he didn't really give a damn about helen because she was a woman and so helen went to go and live with the aunt and uncle who are her guardians but the brother mm-hmm. still exists but nobody really knows that they're related because it's kind of they, they they aren't seen in society together for example yeah and so that leads to them being mistaken for being secret lovers or whatever and it's a huge scandal but actually they're siblings yeah that was still a plot point like a hundred odd years ago that you know it's her brother mm-hmm. actually it's not a yeah there's helen there's her son, Arthur, who was five at most, mm. you know, later seven. Mm-hmm. And Rachel, Helen's sort of friend and servant, who's been with her for her whole life, pretty much. Mm. And then there's two like minor characters, Mary Millwood and Richard Wilson. And they are like mm. the only decent people in the entire book. Yeah. Oh, oh no, and Millicent Hargrave. Um, yeah. But like, you know, you can count on two hands. And, and that means that a lot of the women are pretty awful as well. So in particular, mm. Annabella Wilmot, who marries Lord Lobra. Mm. and has an affair with Helen's husband. Yeah, she's trash. Yeah, and it's so brazen and it's so, you know, like they, they're they not even trying to be that secretive about it because they just don't yeah. care. They know that like nobody can really do anything. And it's just, yeah. it's it reminds me of that like, um that quote from the Gatsby where it's like, oh, they're, they're these people, they like smash up other people's lives and then retreat back into their, their wealth and their everything. Mm. Yeah. I mean, she does end up dying alone i think or yeah something. he divorces her and then marries somebody mm. else who's a lot better for him yeah, yeah. lord lobra ends up in the epilogue where it's like everybody kind of gets their just desserts mm. lord lobra marries somebody about his own age who <laughs> has no money like she's not she's she's got a, a a normal human amount of money she's not come she doesn't come uh, from money uh, she's just yeah. sensible she has good humor she likes him she is an excellent parent to as well step parent to his children not all of whom are actually genetically his because his his first wife was having this affair with Mr. Huntington. Mm. Anyway, but like, you know, it just this thesis statement of actually people in marriage should be partners and mm. our system is not set up to facilitate this. And it's seen as this really weird thing that Lord Loborough does this, but he's happy. Yeah. It's really interesting to me because I feel like she has, a, in some ways, she has a very similar idea of the social good of marriage to Austin, right? Mm, in I agree. The, we've talked about kind of like the Pride and Prejudice epilogue where it kind of talks about the ripple effect of the good marriages that Jane and Elizabeth make to partners that they love and respect yeah. and who love mm-hmm. and respect them in turn and how that models good relationships for everybody else, gives other people opportunities that they wouldn't have had and friendships that they wouldn't have had. Yeah, I talk about that in Persuasion as well. And I think what we what we see demonstrated over and over in this book is the mirror image of that, which is that bad marriages have mm. bad ripple effects, you know? Yeah. We're back to the Shakespeare thing of like, if you listen to your women and respect them and treat them as equals, things will yeah. turn to the good in the end. And if you don't, it's a tragedy. And that's it. like, there is definitely, I mean, maybe someone who has a much more elevated position on English literature <laughs> can, you know, so tell not me us. <laughs> what the proper, like, yeah, I mean, you probably more than me. I'm a STEM nerd. So, you know, I haven't done English. Hey, Eli's a STEM nerd too. Come on. Uh, yeah, but you're more well-read than me. <laughs> <laughs> maybe like, in fanfic. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, anyway just, say, still, say what you're going to say. Still counts. Still counts. Oh, what was I going to say? Like, um, oh, uh, the Gilbert point of view thing. Yeah, like, the fact it's framed from a man's point of view. I was surprised mm. by that. I didn't know it was going to be. 
So I read this first letter and I was like, wait, you're a farmer? Women can't be farmers. <laughs> I, I was, I don't know. I just thought it was a very interesting decision to make mm. because the point that Anne Bronte is making with this book is Gilbert is not the main character. Yeah. Like, so my edition at the end had like reviews from the time. Oh yeah, those are fun. And all the reviews from the men are like, Gilbert's such a lovely chap. He's such a good guy. And then we had to go and listen to this woman ranting for like five billion chapters and I hated it. <laughs> and then he gets the one review by this lady who's like, yeah, this like, you know, happens in real life. And yeah. props to Anne Bronte. Yeah. In obviously, you know, 1800s. Every speak. woman reading it is going, I know these men. And every man reading it is going, Gilbert Markham is perfectly justified in everything he's ever done, ever. I may be like Gilbert. Gilbert is me. And you're just like, you've missed the point. You've missed the point of this novel so bad. Like, you've missed the point of the book. But I kind of feel it's sort of a, like, misdirection in the sense mm. of it's to get... It's sort of like, um, what's the name of the film? With Charlie Theron <laughs> and the cars and on fire. Oh, yeah, Mad, Mad Max, Max. Where they tricked all the MRAs into going to see it with the exploding cars. And then they were like, hold on. There's feminism in this. It's about a woman. <laughs> the woman's the main character. Max doesn't say anything. It's like, yep. And then all the women turn and he's up. He's the perfect man. He just doesn't talk. <laughs> and it's just, it kind of gave me that same vibe of, yeah. even though she's writing under a male pseudonym, which bearing in, did Austin have a pseudonym or did she write it under her own name? No, Austin wrote under her own name. But she was she was also writing things that were appropriate for women to write. Yeah, it's kind of like that's fine. Women can write that kind of romantic, like oh yay, romantic romanticism. Mm. And they needed to have they not only needed to have a pseudonym, but she had a male pseudonym, and then her sort of had to double cover it up with this mm. like male quote unquote protagonist. I wouldn't even call him the protagonist because he's not even the title of the freaking book. Viewpoint character. Yeah, yeah viewpoint character. Yeah, and. I don't know. I just thought it was quite smart. I don't know. I guess it it serves the narrative purpose of showing us Helen Helen as Mrs. Graham through the every person's eyes, like just yeah. a, a random from the village, essentially. Yes. And shows us him coming to know her by being super pushy and like keeping mm, turning up at our house. That's true. Um, mm. But and then you can also then contrast his growing understanding of her against the unchanging backdrop of what the people of the village think yeah but on on that note could you could have written it from a woman's point of view and done exactly the same thing yeah. i don't know that you could have but then you wouldn't have had the romance lottie yeah that but that is true like <laughs> unless Anne Bronte was really ahead of her time <laughs> like that that is the thing i think you couldn't have written from a woman's point of view even though logically from a plot perspective you could have and said oh the women were going to go and investigate who this new person is up the street you know like they're doing yeah. Pride and Prejudice. I tell you what, I would like. I, that's a that's a rewrite. Like it's a modern. It's out of copyright. Let's give it the um, Mad Woman in the Attic treatment. Is it Wide Sargasso Sea? That's the the novel that's from the wife's perspective in Jane Eyre. I don't know, but I know it exists. Anyway, like there's a, there's a bunch of stuff that's that has been written since yeah. about the the Mad Wife in the Attic from Jane Eyre and like you know her perspective on things, mm. please. And what I would really like to see now is like. The tenant of Wildfell Hall from one of the women that we actually like perspective. Yeah. Rose, maybe. Like from the yeah. nice vicar's daughter who's very sensible and marries the classicist. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or, um... Well, here's the thing. I think that a woman's perspective on it is going to have to be very different because either you have the Mary Millwood, that the nice, sensible mm-hmm. vicar's daughter, who is, yeah. what's the phrase? She's like, beloved by dogs, cats, children, and poor people, and neglected by everyone else. Which immediately to me goes, oh, she's probably an absolute sweetheart and one of the only morally good people in this book. And turns out yeah. that's correct. But then mm-hmm. it, Gilbert turns out to be one of the people who neglects and maligns her. So, you know, throw yeah, him Yeah, it's a really trash. awkward yeah. line because he says it and you no. kind of go, oh, oh, okay, he likes her. That kind of seems like he recognises goodness when he sees it. And then he's immediately like, what if I go and then neglect her immediately? And you're like, exactly. oh, you think that's a bad thing. Cool. Okay. So if, if it was written from her perspective, I think she, because she and mm. Helen Graham become friends. And mm. I think yeah. she go, she she is one of the people who would be like, see her and go, mm. oh, uh, protect. The friend protection instinct. You yeah. Know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then you have, and then you have the women who have really invested in gossip and tearing other women down. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. And their instinct is to see her and go. Ooh, a new target for gossip. Rub, rub their little hands yeah. together and go. What I wonder what discord I can sow here. Mm-hmm. And it's it's interesting that the ones who are nice and kind and sort of try not to believe the rumours are the ones who mm-hmm. end up happily married and you know are generally good people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it it it's like you if you're good you attract 
you attract yeah. good people and like mm. yeah i feel gilbert is such a problematic character because like you say i feel if at the time you're a woman reading this you're going yeah gilbert yes also like not great mm. and if you're a man reading this at a time you're probably thinking oh my god he's held up to such a high standard that's <laughs> just what i'm imagining like in my yeah. head you know as a woman i love that you say that because me as a gender queer was reading that i'm going gilbert's not so bad actually compared to all the rest of the men so maybe i am somewhere in the middle i see i mean hey as another gender queer i was going gilbert is trash and i want to physically fight him yeah. <laughs> I, I i don't what i don't like about gilbert is he is so pushy mm, and yes. it's just not only incredibly pushy but he doesn't actually look at the situation around him and analyze it he mm. just thinks like I- i'm just trying to work out I-, I i made a highlight and i'm trying to work out where it is i think it's like uh, later on in the book but it's it's saying oh how can i tell if i am oppressing her when she melts away and makes no sign i'm like well because maybe like that is a quote from that's Hattersley, Hattersley isn't it? Oh, is yeah. it Hattersley? Yeah, yeah sorry. I'm go- so <laughs> Helen's friend, when she is a teenager, ends up marrying one of oh, her abusive husband's yes, friends. That's it. And yes. it's this really, it's I really interested you brought this up because Helen basically does marriage counselling for them. She shows the husband who is a drunk and is very he, he's he is abusive to his wife because yeah. he doesn't give a damn what like you know uh, he's he's pushy and he complains that she's too passive and that she never mm. tells him if you know how, well how should i know if she doesn't like it you know she never says anything and you know it's not my fault if i hurt her if she doesn't say anything yeah and helen basically goes you know what i'm going to show you the letter she wrote to me where she is anxious for you that you are doing damage to yourself with your bad behavior and that she wishes mm-hmm. she could you know and and they fix things he goes mm. oh damn i've been a real asshole and he goes to her his mm-hmm. wife and promises to do better and she is so delighted and overjoyed and he follows through and they are happy Mm. yeah i will say that one of the other things that changes is that because i mean in fairness i don't think she would have been able to do it without his kind of earnest declaration of intent on that short Mm -hmm. but yeah i would say that i think it's a bit more nuanced than him simply improving because she does also start telling him like i'm not saying he's right to be like Mm how am I supposed to know I'm hurting her if she doesn't say anything but like at the same time yeah it she should be saying things I get that it's hard um and like it it's not her fault that she doesn't have the like the the sort of the support that she needs or the skill the problem solving skills that she needs to like be able to say these things to him like the situation the whole situation that leads to her getting married makes it very clear that she doesn't have the agency the 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 skills or the support to be somebody who could stand up for her own needs and wants Mm -hmm. Mm because if she had she would never have married this guy in the first place like she is very clearly bullied into it but like yeah the fact is that he is also like not wrong that if he's never been taught to like care about other people's feelings people are not mind readers yeah, it's obvious to us from the outside because we were like most of it, you know, we had good examples growing up. We've got good friendships. We've got good relationships. We know mm. what the give and take of I have needs and you have needs. Let's work this out looks like, right? Yeah. She doesn't and he doesn't. We see it very clearly with all of his friends. He has no idea what a balanced, loving, respectful, boundaried relationship looks like. Right? And I yeah. think that's what makes him redeemable when Huntington isn't because... Helen is very good at saying, I have needs. I don't like mm. what you're doing. This is, yeah. you know, and mm. and he just doesn't care. Whereas yeah. Hattersley doesn't have that that opportunity to, to prove himself until Helen tells him that he needs to and mm. he puts in the work to let his wife know that she will be listened to if she says these things. Yeah. Um, whereas Helen has repeated evidence that when she does say these things and mm. she does put herself out there and try and work mm. things out she is yeah. just completely disregarded yeah i, w- I want to talk about that actually because it was something that i thought was very interesting and one of the th- examples of this is an v- incredibly nuanced novel right these characters mm-hmm. are all incredibly complicated interesting real Definitely. feeling people and one of the ways that, that is very true of helen in particular is that i think okay so one, i think one of the thesis statements of this novel is that if you are surrounded by bad people it is really really hard 
to form good habits and become it like be a good person yourself right i think yeah. that is a, a theme we see over and over is that you see it with lord lobra it is an individual yeah. choice but it is also a community responsibility right and lord lobra is a really good example of that i think mm. but one of the things that helen says uh, of herself like fairly uh, quite a way through her diary is that she realizes that she has become she has become worse through contact with these people, right? Her, yeah. her forthrightness, she loses, and I think she loses very quickly that direct honesty that we see in her early, like, refusals of marriage proposals, right? Yeah. Her aunt keeps got fluttering around being like, give a soft no, let make him yeah. think it's not about him, it's just about you being too young for marriage, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, well, I don't. Th- that's not true, and I'm not going to say it. Yeah. Very early on in her relationship with Huntington, we see her start to withhold... We see her start to like pick her emotional courses of action with regard to whether she thinks they will be effective in manipulating Huntingdon into being a better person. Right? Mm -hmm. She's working on his level. She because she spends time with him and she ends up communicating the way he does because she thinks that's the only way she can get through to him. Right? And I think without realizing really that 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 method of communication is in and of itself bad and harmful. And I think this comes to a head in the um. Like when there's two instances where we see her get her honesty back towards the end of the diary. And it's one where she like, she's kind of forced into it because Lord Lobra already has worked out about the affair. And she Mm. says she knows and she said she thought it would be kinder if she didn't. And she already like, she could have told him before he married her. And she Mm -hmm. didn't. She knew before they got married that the wife didn't love him and was only in it Mm. for the title. And like, I think that's the moment where she realizes that that's something that she's lost and that that's the, the approach that she needs to take. And like, it doesn't, like, it doesn't backfire on her, right? She's honest with him. And he says, why didn't you tell me? And she explains. And they come to an understanding. She says, I think I should have, actually. You're right. There's this very clear moment of, like, you get me. We, we are seeing each other here, right? Yeah. And then we see when she next talks to the Hattersleys, right? Previously, she when she's tried mm-hmm. to intervene, she has refused to show him her letters from yeah. Millicent, right? And she's refused to be, like... Here is the actual information that I have about what you're doing that's wrong from your wife's own lips, right? She's been, she's done her best within her her lights, but she hasn't been fully direct and honest with him about what the problem is, yeah? Mm-hmm. And then she gets to, after this encounter with Lobra, she's like, okay, look, I am going to, I am going to get you the letters and I am going to give you this and I am going to be as direct and honest with you about what's wrong as I can be. And it works. Yeah. And that, I think, is very telling of mm-hmm. like just i would say there's another instance where she Mm. notices that she has become worse yeah and that is um the affair between her husband and lord lobra's wife is now in the open she she Mm. and her husband are now husband and wife in name only they have agreed that between themselves yeah Mm. and or rather she has said that to him because she's just done and Mm. she is now being pursued by mr hargrave in a, you know the, the one who's like oh i'm not like other men i'm you know oh you know you, your husband doesn't treat you right i'm here to treat you right puts her on a pedestal yeah, yeah. puts her on a pedestal and almost rapes her in the end and only only doesn't because she holds him at knife point with her palette knife which is one of the most badass and most miserable that it had mm. to happen moments anyway, yeah she's being pursued by him and she has the thought that maybe i should inc- maybe i should encourage his affections to make my husband jealous and then she realizes mm. she's had this thought and gone, has mm. gone, like, you know, and, and her phrasing of it is like, no good Christian, whatever, had this thought. But it's, it's her realizing that she has become like them. She has, she has adapted herself mm. into their method of communication. I was also kind of going to say, it's like, she's kind of adapted herself and the way she responds, like, she kind of loses that boundary setting that she had when she was 18. She's mm-hmm. like, no, I'm not going to marry this guy because. I think it was like, he's boring and he's boring and she's going to actually mm-hmm. say that to his face. And and we could not make each other good partners. We could yeah, not be good and, partners And, and she's other. very, very upfront about that. Mm-hmm. And then as you go on, I, I personally got this feeling like she's sort of placating her husband in oh, order yeah. to prevent the abuse. Like she, yeah. she's basically saying, I'm walking on eggshells here. I need to say what he wants to hear so yeah. I don't get abused physically or uh, uh, emotionally yeah he he'll stop it and mm-hmm. and i think that's kind of when she got to the point where she uses like she she stops it with this the, the palette knife is kind of her going i am not p- 
putting up with this anymore. Well, she's mm. already decided to leave by that point because the reason she has the the reason she has the palette knife is because she has started painting to make money to leave. Yeah, it's kind of she's out of like this fog of like she's been put in this environment in this very restricted environment. She can't go anywhere, see yeah. anyone, do anything. And she sort of resigned herself to it. Mm. And then she kind of the fog moves and she's like, oh, this i'm gonna yeah. get out of this situation and i don't care because not only does she her leaving is not only illegal because of marriage but she is technically the property of her husband and all the mm. paintings she's been trying to, she's like oh, i'm gonna sell my paintings to to mm. make money her money is also the property of her husband and yeah. also the fact that like marital rape is not illegal so there's so many things I mean, it wasn't until like the 80s right yeah like 80 like late 80s or 90s even and it's mm-hmm. kind of it's sort of the amount of effort she is going through to get herself out of the situation and the amount of legal trouble she could get into if it was found out. Yeah. So I'm desperately trying to remember because there was a contemporary case with a woman who... um, uh, Sarah is always telling me about this and I like, I forget her name every single time, but it was was a really prominent case and it was about contemporary with this book coming out. It was a woman who left her husband because he was abusive. He was a terrible, terrible person. Um, and couldn't get custody of her kids. And she kept trying to earn a living on her own, and she couldn't because all of her money legally belonged to her husband. And, like, it it was... But it was a big scandal, and it was really, Mm. really in the public eye. And is one of the reasons that, like, there were laws changed about married women's property eventually, because this this case really brought it into the light. And it's really annoying me that I can't remember the name yeah. of the woman now. <laughs> we'll find it. We'll, we'll find it. We'll put it in the Tumblr post. But like, yeah, we'll put it in the notes. But yeah, I can't, I, you can't help but wonder if this is, you know, this is obviously like a, a political concern that is very like uh, active what's at that the time. Word? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is one of the things, this is kind of what I was talking about when I said that the the like one of the this this book can be read as an exploration of women's agency because helen just has none at that point she is trying to make she's trying to do paintings and sell them to Mm. hoard some money so that she can take herself and her son and one of the most heartbreaking moments for me in the whole book was Mm. um was her husband finding out about this plan taking all of her money destroying all of her painting supplies and holding her hostage essentially and and the the awful thing well you know it's obviously awful anyway but it's Mm. all entirely legal it's all Within yeah. the eyes of society, that's all au fait. And it's just so miserable. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say before we, we're probably going to wrap up at some point, but I was going to just... Mm-hmm. One thing that really bugged me and didn't make any sense, why she marries Gilbert. Because oh, she yeah, inherits... Oh, yeah, let's talk about that. <laughs> she inherits all of this, all of the, the, the husband's wealth mm. in the house... Yeah. And and she has all this money, the house, she's got security for the kid. The yeah. minute she marries Gilbert, it's all his. In my opinion, I do not understand, given she spent so long trying to get away from like being tied and build down agency for herself. And yeah. have agency for herself. Like, if she's got all this money, why the hell doesn't she just have flames? Nobody ca- like <laughs> nobody realistically is gonna care because she's got all this money. She he can be her boy toy. Yeah. Exactly. I agree, frankly. But it like it doesn't make sense why she gets married and part of me i just made a note of like is this an editorial change she is a person would not have an extramarital relationship she she is too principled about like there again that is true that is true yeah i i, I want to res- like respect that as well like it is a it's a choice that she makes and it's she but has I a really strong sense she has no. really strong sense of principles and i think that's really important to her and something that, that true, got her yeah. through her terrible marriage so it's not really surprising it's why she goes back to her awful husband to care for him while he's dying oh and one thing i do want to mention because mm. we haven't said it explicitly yet in this episode the awful do- husband does die horribly directly as a result of his own actions so that's very satisfying to read i was live <laughs> this to em as i was reading i was like yes he's dying yes <laughs> we're popping the biggest bottles yeah if you were worried it was all doom and gloom like huntington does die horribly and it's everything he deserves <laughs> Karma yeah. comes to all. Yeah, but yeah. I was going to say about the Gilbert thing. Actually, one of one of the things I think this is in response to is mm-hmm. at least partially a, a trend that, like, for me at least, is set up in Pride and Prejudice. And obviously, I'm not an expert in the literature of the time, so presumably there are other examples of this. And we see it in modern rom coms, right? You, I think Pretty Woman's a really good example. Um, anything based on Pride and Prejudice, but like where the woman like goes through a whole bunch. Of, she has two options. I mean, Jane Eyre is another example. She has two options of men and she doesn't, like, 
she gets to a point in the narrative like the climax of the of the narrative is that um like she doesn't need either of them she doesn't have to make the choice anymore because she's financially solvent or because you know they're like for example for lizzie like you know her family's not going to be on the street because jane's husband's rich right so she doesn't have to make that choice anymore jane eyre is like rich in her own right and she doesn't have to choose between rochester and boring um missionary man um or his sisters who i think would be a much more convincing romantic (laughs) choice for her but let's move away from that for a second and pretty woman like she you know she decides she's made the decision on her own to like go back to school to go back to her family to like Mm -hmm. make changes in her own life and as a reward these people get married Right. Yeah. And one of the things I think the Gilbert marriage is sort of critiquing, and I think a lot of the marriages, the happy marriages in the book are actually critiquing is the fact that we see that as the happy ending at all. Mm. Like that's yeah. the, it, it's presented as the only way out of this system to the point where even if you very clearly have another way out by being like financially independent, people yeah. still take it. Mm. Yeah. And I think, I don't think it's intended to be a like, Gilbert is her prize for like winning through and sticking by her morals. No, and it's it, like her only way out. It's the, it, no, it, well, it's not because she's financially solvent. I mean that it's 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 so ingrained that yeah. that's what she does anyway. Even though mm-hmm. Gilbert is not perfect by any stretch, you know, it's yeah. still that's how the novel ends. You got to do it. I think we are meant to ask that question, Lottie. Yeah, like, yeah. You know that yeah. is true. That is um, true. We are running out of time, so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> who would you fight Huntingdon is not allowed boring answer Gilbert <laughs> Gilbert, Gilbert. I'd crack him with a whip just like <laughs> you he cracks someone else oh with yeah whip. can we talk about that he's just like a, a, an appropriate response to me thinking that the woman I'm in love with who has repeatedly told me that she's not interested or like cannot be with me for various reasons is to go beat up the guy I think she likes I'm gonna, I'm gonna smack him I'm gonna leave him in the road to die that'll endear me to her it's like that'll be fine no you're a yeah. prick like, yeah Gilbert deserves to be eviscerated for that and he feels like he's been wronged and he's perfectly entitled to that I'm just like oh okay you're a terrible person and I hate you good night he's trash. also the vicar I just really dislike him oh yeah the vicar I would fight Hargrave oh yeah solid the one choice who, yeah. the one who is, is the, the, the Mr. Nice Guy I would go one step further with that palette knife and just gut him like a fish. Yeah, I think that's valid. It's what he deserves. So what do you think the cat would rate this book? Okay, so I want to make it clear there is actually a cat in this book. Yeah, that is true. In a throwaway scene. But there was a cat. There was a cat (laughs) demonstrating that cats and dogs love Mary Millwood. uh, And so do I. Yeah. Oh, and also like as as a vehicle for some like very like... (laughs) Men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Modern feeling gender, like politics bullshit (laughs) about how women are so nice to cats and that's why men hate cats because like they want all the attention that women are giving to cats. I'm like, I'm happy to call you a wretch and like shove medicine down your throat. Mm-hmm. I'll do that. Like, yeah. <laughs> Isn't that basically what Helen is doing to Huntington the entire time? I mean, yeah, to be yeah. fair. Uh, not that I want to compare Huntington to a cat because God, that is doing cats so dirty. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> I, yeah. I don't think the cat would rate this one very highly because I just don't think it's very... She, it, It's too heavy for her. She's, yeah. she's just not about yeah. that. You know, she's a cat. She doesn't have to care about the oppressive structures of marriage in the 1850s. Yeah, that's kind of that's part of the bonus of being a cat, right? Is yeah, you don't yeah. have to care about so that You walk away from all these like boring human structures and um, stab them if you don't like them. Yeah, the integrity of the cat rating I feel so far has been: is there a cat and is there crime? I mean, <laughs> all of the crime is like awful crime that's actually like yeah. moral moral crime. It's not like be gay do crime crime. It's like you're yeah. a bad person. Yeah. Crime. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Well, and a, a lot of it isn't actually crimes. Like a lot of it isn't technically illegal by the standards of the day. So it's just sin. It's just treating people as things. Which is just depressing. Yeah. Honestly, I think it might be a token one for the presence of the cat. Yeah. Yeah. Like a great, great book. You know, caveats to reading it in that it deals with a load of heavy stuff. We mm. don't think it's a one, but I think Gothamog maybe thinks it's a one. Yeah. I think, the cat, I, think I personally would rate it like, 11 out of 10 for dealing with these themes yeah like and then i think i need to go and have a nap afterwards i would yeah i would say everyone should read this if i didn't think that like uh 49 percent of the population would read it and take entirely the wrong end of the stick but (laughs) (laughs) um yeah on the note of uh the cat reading more light-hearted and you know less heavy stuff um Mm -hmm. uh, lottie do you want to talk about what we're reading next time 
Oh, yes. So next week, we're going to be reading The Final Empire by Brandon Sanson, which is the Woo-hoo! first book in the original uh, Mistborn trilogy, which I am so hyped about. Yes. I'm so excited to be reading all Brandon Sanderson again. Um, like, yeah, I'm, so I'm so excited. I mean, it, I think the cat will like it because it has a lot of crime. It features a crime syndicate. So, you oh, know, perfect. a lot of crime and a lot of sneaking around and a lot of jumping. So, yeah. Excellent. She does love that. V-hype. Awesome. So, so yeah, thank you all so much for listening. Um, please like, subscribe and review. Add us on all our socials. You can check out which socials we have on our website teachingmycattoread.wordpress.com which I think will be linked in the description box below also we have a good reads now please follow us and befriend us so it doesn't look like we have no friends and um, <laughs> guilt trip <laughs> and also we have a ko-fi which ko-fi coffee oh my god what am I like um <laughs> and this is basically where you can give us a couple of quid and quote-unquote buy us a coffee and all the proceeds go towards our podcast hosting so you can listen to all the uh, episodes so they stay online if you want to recommend us a book ping us an email on the contact form on our website add hello there so we know you're not spam so yes say hello send us a message and recommend us some books to read big virtual hugs and we'll see you next time bye bye